We often wonder sometimes why God does what God does. And uh, probably should learn not to do that. But when John Joe sang, it made sense. Uh, so I'm going to have you turn to John chapter 14 this morning. This was not, this was a message that I was not intending several days ago to do, but uh, now I know why. So it uh, all ties together with what God has in plan. Appreciate you all being here. I know we have a few folks visiting for the first time. And we're glad that you're with us and those guests that are back with us. Uh, we appreciate you being here as well. Those joining online, uh, we certainly miss you, but understand, uh, understand where you are and, and, and glad that you're watching us uh, th- th- this morning and, and uh, appreciate you being here as well. Pastor will be back uh, with you Sunday. Uh, Brother Ethan is preaching tonight, so make sure uh, you're all back for that. That'll be good. That'll be good for us to, to hear that, so... We appreciate, appreciate you all being here. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into a passage today that I hope will uh, tie in with John Joe's song and be an encouragement to us as well. Father, we uh, love you, and we know this morning that uh, you have something uh, special for us. Uh, whenever we show up, uh, you're already there, and, and that means that uh, there's something for us to, to learn. So I pray today that those that are here in this room, those that are listening and watching online, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would minimize distraction, that you would open our hearts, open our ears to the message that you have for us. Uh, We know it'll be unique, it'll be different for each individual, uh, but yet each of us this morning uh, needs to worship you, one, but we need to hear from you and have a need uh, that we have be met. And you can do that, we know that you can, and so I pray this morning that you would help us with that. Help us now as we look into your word, pray that you make it clear, Uh, take the thoughts that I have and empower them, help me to get out of the way, and just allow your word to do its work. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in John chapter 14, of course, this particular passage of Scripture, starting with John chapter 13 and really going all the way through uh, John chapter 17. It's, it really is an amazing section, amazing portion of Scripture. If you haven't spent much time Uh, In this particular section, I'd certainly encourage you to do so because we know that what is taking place here in just a matter of hours, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. And what we see in these chapters, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 particularly, is really Jesus' last, if you will, hours, uh, last day, last hours here on this earth. Uh, before his crucifixion and we get a real sense of the heart of Jesus we see him interacting with his disciples later on you get to be witness and part of his prayer in the garden of Gethsemane to to God the Father and and you get a really really great glimpse at uh, what Jesus is going through and what he is communicating to those that are around him which in a sense comes to communicate to us today uh, some truths that, that will help us as we, we go through life. Now, our, our attention this morning is going to be in John chapter 14, uh, a, a passage of Scripture that probably outside John 3.16 might very well be the most familiar passage in Scripture. It's one in which even uh, all believers would know and certainly unbelievers are aware of. And I want to focus our attention on verses 1 through 6. Now, we'll look at some things in chapter 13. We'll look at some other things here in the passage. But I want to focus our attention on uh, verses 1 through 6. And and real simply, uh, kind of share with you today five truths, five things uh, that Jesus has to say around the theme, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. So let's read the passage, and you know it's very familiar. Uh, John chapter 14, verse number 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So five things I want us to kind of walk away this morning. And they're all starting in honor of pastor with the letter P. And uh, so we want to look at five different things. Number one, we want to look at the problem. We'll identify that here in just a moment. Secondly, we want to talk about the place. Thirdly, we'll talk about the promise. And there's actually multiple promises in this passage. Then we'll look at the path, which is, of course, going to be verse number six. And then the most important thing to leave with today is an understanding of the person. And we'll talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, an illustration for you that may or may not work. Um, uh, This may, may not resonate with you. For some of you, you'll understand the illustration I'm about to give. Some of you, you're not old enough yet to understand, but one day you will. When you get into your 50s, and I've arrived into that club a few years past, uh, so when you get into your 50s, you get this wonderful joy and opportunity to visit various doctors for various uh, assessments, right? Now, I'm going to leave it at that. You just kind of fill in the blanks. But you get this privilege to visit these doctors, uh, and you get a lot of exciting and fun, fun, fun tests that you get to go through. And I guess they're intended to see how much damage you may have done to your life uh, over the previous 50 years. But nonetheless, you hit a certain age and you go through this process. Well, recently, I had the joy of going through some of those um, examinations, some of those tests. Now, it's interesting that as you go through those, of course, you, you wait the different results and, and, and you pray that they'll all be good, but knowing that God knows best, so whatever it is, it's in His hand anyway. And yet, you still wait for these results. And, and, and what I'm about to share did not happen to me, but maybe it happened to someone in here, and you're one of the fortunate ones. But let's just assume that I had finished those different examinations and I'm back in the doctor's office and the doctor walks in, he's carrying his little pad now, uh, and his little iPad and he has all the little results and he's kind of shaking his head back and forth a little bit and he's standing in front of you and, and, and the conversation goes something like this, Mr. Brewer, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. I'm, I am amazed. I, 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 I'm almost at a loss for words. Now, again, this didn't happen. Um, In in fact, I I don't think I've ever seen anyone as healthy as you. In fact, you're you're a specimen of what a healthy person should look like. Your blood pressure, that's the best blood pressure we've ever seen. Your cholesterol reading, beautiful, natural. Now, again, none of this happened to me, unfortunately. Uh, Oh, by the way, your weight, perfect, ideal. In fact, you don't even need a scale in your house anymore. Okay, everything's just wonderful. So he goes down this litany of things of just how wonderful I look and how great of a shape I am in and all my blood results and everything was perfect. And when he wraps that up, I'm sitting there smiling, right? I'm thinking to myself, I've earned a trip to Dairy Queen today, okay? Uh, now, if you're a little more sophisticated, maybe you go to Crumble and get you some cookies, all right? But, but for some of us, a good old turtle pecan blizzard works all the time. So I'm sitting here, and he's telling me just how great a shape I am. I'm going to go celebrate. Now, when he's done, and this is all hypothetical. This next part may not be. um, He begins to scratch the things on his iPad. He said, you know, just as a precaution, I'm going to send over to, would you say CVS is who your pharmacy is? I'm going to send over to CVS a couple of prescriptions. One is that this is brand new cholesterol medicine. And just as a precaution, I'm going to go ahead and prescribe that to you. And while we're at it, uh, we probably should go ahead and include some blood pressure medication. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and send that prescription over. Now, if you had just heard that great report, I know it's hard to imagine, but you just heard the great report, and then the doctor says he's going to prescribe some medicine, you would look at him like a cow looking at a new gate, like, what, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Now, probably, if you didn't get that good report, you probably still looked at it that way, right? You know, I'm not doing this stuff. But the point is, I would look at him at like, why in the world would I ever go pick up that prescription? And why would I not pick up the prescriptions? Because I don't have any problems. 
I don't have any problems. You just told me everything was great. Why in the world would you give me medication for something that I don't need? I would just blow him off. I would take that prescription, throw it in the trash, never even fill it, never pick it up. Just ignore him completely. He's crazy. And he's crazy because I don't have a problem. Now, here's where we're going to go with this. We, as individuals, don't look for answers to problems we don't have. Okay? We don't. We don't go around looking for an answer to a problem that we don't have. Yet, note this, when we have problems, we look for answers. Okay? And Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse number 1. Now, he's speaking to his disciples, but it's universal. We all have problems. Now, I know you're looking at your neighbor going, that's right. They definitely have a problem. But we all have problems. You walked in the door this morning carrying a problem. Some of you, your family and friends, know what the problem is. Some of you, they don't know what it is. Some of us try to mask the problem, try to hide the problem, because we don't want anybody to know. But the truth of the matter is, we know that as we go through life, we are and will have problems. And when we have those problems, Jesus, in this passage, talking to his disciples, outlines for them the solution to their problem, and that solution is applicable 2,000 years later. It's no different. It's absolutely no different. So what is the problem that we have. What is the problem that we have? Look at verse number one. The problem. Number one, point number one, the problem. The problem is simply this. Let not your heart be what? Troubled. That's the problem. The problem is trouble. The problem is trouble. Let not your heart be troubled. There are many things that you and I deal with as we walk through life that trouble our heart. And so what do we mean by trouble? By definition, you go in and look at this in Webster or whomever, and trouble carries the definition that it's anything that causes one inward commotion. You know what I'm talking about? Anything that makes you inside not be at rest. What keeps you awake at night besides the bad pizza, right? Uh, What is it that gets me up in the middle of the night and prevents me from falling back to sleep? What is it that raises my level of anxiety and my emotion as I'm headed into work tomorrow? What is it when the phone rings and I look at who it is that my inward commotion goes to a different level? The point is fairly simple that trouble as defined in this passage is anything that creates inside of us an inward commotion. It goes on to say this, it's something that takes away our calmness of mind. Trouble makes us distressed. It stresses us out. Now, I I, I would be willing to venture that there's almost a unanimous percentage of us in the room that would understand what trouble is. Uh, We're in the middle of it today. We came in the door with it. It's waiting on us when we leave. Uh, We are carrying around. We have trouble. In fact, the scripture promises trouble. Job chapter 5, verse number 7 says, Yet a man is born unto trouble. That's the sparks fly upward. Job 14, 1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And then Jesus told his disciples, and it's applicable to us today in John chapter 16, right in this passage, verse number 33, he says, In the world you shall have what? Tribulation, trouble. So we know that we have a problem, and we know that the problem is trouble, and what I love about our definition of trouble is very broad. Now the disciples, we're going to see specifically what troubled them. But the principle applies. The principle is across the board. And the principle is that whatever trouble you're carrying, Jesus is going to address that in the problem. So what does this passage teach us about the troubles we face? Two things. Number one, Jesus knows our troubles. 
Now, this is not a rocket science. We all know this, and sometimes we hear it, and what we hope today is that it moves from what's inside our brain down into our heart, and it becomes uh, very important in helping us deal with the troubles. But go back to chapter 13 with me and look at verse number 1. Chapter 13, verse number 1. We're going to read through a bunch of different verses here real quick like, but Jesus knows our trouble. How do I know that he knows our trouble? Because he told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. He could see it on their face. He could see it uh, in their emotions. But notice chapter 13, verse number 1. Jesus, the, the scripture says this, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So Jesus here, this is in the upper room, the crucifixion is imminent. He understands that uh, all that he has been uh, here on earth for is about to culminate, and he understands that this change is going to create some real angst for his disciples. Those folks that have been with him for those three years, things are about to be changed. The world's about to be turned upside down. And Jesus knows that the end is near. And he knows there's trouble. Look at verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, and there's a whole lot of good stuff in there, but when Jesus had thus said, he was what? Troubled in spirit. And testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. So not only is Jesus about to depart, okay, we're going to see that in just a moment. Not only does Jesus know that the end is near for his time here on earth, but he also articulates to his disciples here that one of you, one of you, will betray me. And they're looking around, wondering who that's going to be, and so on and so forth. Drop down to verse 33 with me. He says, Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and I said unto the Jews, Whether I go, you cannot come, so now I say unto you. In other words, he reveals to his disciples that, Hey, I'm about to leave. I'm about to leave. I'm about to depart. And to add another layer to that, look at verse 37 and 38. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So on top of everything else, he looks at Peter and says, Peter, you're going to deny me. So when you start and, and you parse all of these things together, you have this scenario of the trouble. What's the trouble? Number one, I'm leaving. Okay, uh, My end is near. The crucifixion is ahead of me. Number two, somebody in this group, you're, you're going to betray me. Peter, right-hand man, guys, you, you, you've been serving and working and outgoing and, and so forth. You, Peter, even Peter, you're going to deny me. And by the way, I'm going away. So he unveils all of these things to these disciples. And in the midst of the unveiling of that, we can see what troubled them. Just imagine, you've been working with Jesus for three years. He called you to come. He said, follow me. And okay, you left everything and followed him. And you've devoted your time to learning and listening and growing and, and, and ministering. And you've seen all of this take place. And now all of that's about to disappear. That would create some trouble. He, he, he was aware of their trouble, and he articulated that to them. And they're confused and troubled. Now, here's the point I want you to grasp. None of this was a surprise to Jesus. None of it. He was aware of the trouble. And not only is he aware of our troubles, I love something I saw in this passage jumped out at me. I got a little excited. Look at verse 21. There's something in verse 21 I thought was just really good. It's just amazing to me. Been there all the time. I just saw it this week. It said, when Jesus had thus said. So when he told them all this stuff, notice what it says. He was troubled. Do you know that word troubled in verse 21? That Jesus was troubled is the exact same word as in chapter 14, verse number 1, trouble. Here's what that means, and this is good. Not only is Jesus aware of our troubles, but we know that Scripture teaches us in uh, Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was what? Was in all points 
tempted like as we are yet without sin. He knows what it means to be troubled. So we have a God who's aware of our trouble, and we have a God who's experienced our trouble. He knows our troubles. And so when he looks at his disciples and he says to them, don't let your heart be troubled. He's speaking as one who's aware of what they're feeling, and he's speaking as one who knows, understands, feels, sees what they've felt, yet without sin, yet without sin. And we have that as our high priest. So he comes to these disciples out of the gate, and he says, hey, listen, I know your troubles. But beyond that, let me give you point number two. Not only does he know our troubles, but number two, he cares about our troubles. So we'll be pretty quick here. You go back to verse number one of chapter 13. Verse number one of chapter 13. Notice what he says. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Now that's important. Keep in mind, he knew that the hour was come. Okay, so the crucifixion is around the corner, understanding all that that's going to mean, both in what we know about the crucifixion and the punishment of our sin that he placed upon himself. Notice where his focus is. It's really important. Don't miss this. He says here, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So not only does he know about our troubles, but he cares about our troubles. Here Jesus is, the crucifixion's around the corner, and it says that he loved his own, he cared for his own. You read the passage, he's going to wash their feet, demonstrating that humility and that service. But his emphasis in our life, in the lives of these disciples at the moment, his emphasis was on us, and he knows us. He knows the hairs, or lack thereof, on our head. He knows us, okay? He understands the challenges that we're faced with. He knows the problems that we're aware of, and he's not just aware of them. He cares about them. He cares about them. He cares about them. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength. What? A very present help in trouble. Present help. Folks, you walked in the door with troubles. Don't walk out with them. Don't walk out with them. Jesus knows about them. He cares about them. He says, let not your heart be troubled. So I know we have troubles in this life. I understand that. That's a given. What he says next helps us work through these troubles. What does Jesus say to his disciples to comfort them in their time of trouble? Now, don't miss what's about to happen. Here's a phrase I want you to keep mind of. Is he shifts their focus from the present to the future. Okay, it's very important. He shifts their focus from this world to the next world. He shifts their focus from where they are in the moment to what's ahead. He shifts their focus. In fact, he says there in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And then what he says in verse two, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place For you. In chapter 13, verse number 33, he told them that he was leaving. Now, in chapter 14, verse number 2, he tells them where he's going. So, number one, there's a problem, which is trouble. Number two, what Jesus does is he tells them about a place, and then he's going to share with them a promise. So he tells them about a place, and that place, of course, we know is heaven. He assured them that even though they may not know what is going to occur, Even though they may not know what's going to occur, he did. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. He knew what the end looked like from the beginning. He understands what the plan is. He can see the whole picture. And when you take that, you you, you put that into our lives today, the truth still rings very clear. We may not have any idea of what today will bring. And we don't. We have no idea what tomorrow is. We have great plans for tomorrow, but we have no idea what tomorrow may bring. We hope what tomorrow will bring, but we don't know. We don't know. But here's what we do know. He does. He knows. These disciples are all bent out of shape. Where are you going? Where are you going? And he says, you may not know where I'm going, but I do. And there's this place. Let me tell you about it. And he gives a little broad, not much of a description of the place, right? 
But he gives them this idea of this place that he's going to. And the application, of course, is very simpler, simply for us is that we know the end. It reminds me of Abraham. I put here in my notes in Abraham uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. You know this, 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 the passage is that faith chapter. And it says in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 8 through 10, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out unto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, now catch this, not knowing whither he went. Go back and read that sometimes in Genesis 12. He, he didn't know where he was going. But by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Catch this, for he looked for a city. He looked for a city. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hey, look for the city. Whatever trouble we're in, we know the end. We know the destination. You say, well, John, that's, you, you, that doesn't help me today. Oh, it should. It should. I was talking with somebody this week, and I said, you know, this, this is not going to sound real uh, bright or anything, but we're going to live longer in eternity than we've lived longer on earth. And that's not a real bright statement, but it sure is true. Whatever it is, I'm in the middle of the day, it's a blip compared to eternity. And so Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming again. John Joe, we shall see, we shall see Jesus. We shall see Jesus. We, we understand that. And you say, well, John, that doesn't help me get through the grind of the day. It gives me hope for the future, which gives me grind through the day. And so we can rest in that truth and knowing that He has delivered for us. By the way, the illustration, I was reading several different commentaries, is quite interesting. The illustration would not have been a foreign one to His disciples. Because evidently in that day, and, and, and I'm somewhat glad this concept has passed. Uh, evidently in that day, in the old times, it was, it was normal that when a child got married, uh, that they would just add on to the house. Yeah, 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 I'm not sure about that. Sorry, kids, if y'all are listening. Uh, but it wasn't a foreign concept, right? The, the child got married, they'd add on to the house, they'd keep building, keep building, keep building, keep building, and so forth. The idea is the houses became larger and larger as each child was married. But you know what? In my father's house, there are a whole bunch of mansions. There are a whole bunch of them. You know, Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. There's mansions. You say, but John, what's that all look? I, I don't know. Scripture is pretty, uh, not, not completely clear on all of those things. We do know that in 2, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 9, it says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of the man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. What I do know about the mansion, it's better than anything I can visualize today. And I know it's better than the trouble, whatever the trouble is. It pales in comparison to what heaven's going to be like. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I know you guys are worried, I know you're concerned, I know you have angst, but let me tell you something, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Why? Because I know where I'm going. And where I'm going, you're going to be also. So we can be comforted in our trouble by having faith that he's prepared a place for us. And then Jesus gives them a promise. He gives them a promise in verse number 3. And I will go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. There it is. There it is. He told them, I have to leave. I have to leave. I have to leave. Um, don't be troubled. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come again. That's the promise. Now, you got to think about this promise a little bit. Now, think about this. Very important. Uh, it's, it's real simple, but, but sometimes I think we miss it. It, it, it. What does this promise mean to us? Now think about it. If he right now is preparing a place for us, okay? He's preparing a place for us. Okay? We, we, the Bible says he's preparing a place. He's talking to his disciples, applicable to us. He's preparing a place for us, okay? And then it says that he's coming again, okay? It says he's coming again. I'm preparing a place for you, okay? And I'm coming again. 
Okay, that's true. We know that he's coming again. We know that. And we know right now he's preparing a place for us. But that gives us this gap. Okay, that gap is between where I am right now and where I'm going to be. Okay, there's this gap. So what happens in the gap? Here's what needs to happen in the gap. If he's preparing a place for us, we know he is. And if he's coming again, which we know he is, then it has to mean he's going to keep us in between. He's going to take care of us in the gap. We, we don't have to worry about that. He told you, I'm coming again. He told you, I'm building you a place. So what's that mean? That means in between, he's going to keep us so that when it's time for us to be there, we'll be there. But everything in between, he's making sure we'll be ready when it's time to be there. We're not going to be there before time. We're not going to be there after time. We're going to be there at right time. But he takes care of us in the gap. So I was chewing through that, thinking that a little bit. And I just simply note this. Uh, because he keeps us. We can rest in Him. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? He's keeping me. I don't know exactly how all that's going to work out. But I just know it's what He promised. It's what He promised. We can look at a lot of scriptures on that. Hebrews 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promise. Romans 4 21 and being fully persuaded that when he had promised he was able also to perform. Joshua 23 14 back in the Old Testament. Joshua said and behold this day I am going the way of all the earth and you know in all your hearts and all your souls catch this not that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass and not one thing have failed thereof. 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God uh, of God in Him are yea. Listen to me. We know by experience, we go around this room this morning, we know by experience that there is not one promise, not one promise that God has made that He has not kept. There's not one. So why in the world would we think that He's not going to keep the one that says He'll keep us? Let not your heart be troubled. Why not be troubled? Because I promise I'm going away. I'm going away. And and, and I'm going to build a mansion. And I promise that I'm coming back. And you say, well, John, if if he's going away and building a mansion, he's coming back for me, it means that he's going to keep me. But how? We won't have time to dive into this, but just for fun at some point. uh, Well, why don't we just, we got we got a few minutes. Drop down to verse, uh, verse 16. This is how he keeps us. Chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says, and I will what? I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. Man, what, what's the best solution for trouble besides a comforter? Right? It's a comforter. We could go off on all types of illustrations about all the blankets you have around the house, right? I'm getting to the spot. I didn't think it would happen. I get chilly. It's part of that 50 thing again, I guess. Uh, But we have blankets all around the house. I'll just wrap one around me. That fan's on high and the air's on whatever, but I still, once you turn the fan off. But it's a comforter, right? It's a blanket, but it gives me some sense of comfort. It's nothing like the Holy Spirit. Nothing like the Holy Spirit. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, don't be troubled because I'm going away. But don't worry. I'm going to, in verse 16, I'll pray the Father and He'll give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But you know Him, ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not. Leave you comfortless. I will come again. It's a promise to his disciples, but it's a promise to us. We have a comforter. We have the Holy Spirit. So there's another promise there. There's another promise. So Jesus says, I've prepared a place for you. I'm coming back for you. And in the meantime, I'll give you a comforter. And the comforter will help you in the midst of your struggles. Now finally, as we wrap up, let's look at these last two keys. The path and the person. Thomas here in verse number 4 Uh, Or verse number 5, Thomas uh, sometimes gets a bad rap doubting Thomas. I I can just see him working in his brain because I I can relate to Thomas. 
uh, you know, things don't add up, and I'm kind of trying to figure out why. Uh, like all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, and, and uh, you learn through life not everything is rational, but if you're wound that way or created that way, you still want to know the answers, right? Uh, but Thomas is, Thomas is kind of over there probably scratching his head a little bit, and he says, Lord, um, uh, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know? I mean, I think it's a legitimate question. I know we can beat up on Thomas, but I think Thomas is really, he's trying to understand, and what does Jesus do? He just answers him. By the way, he does that with our questions. He'll answer, give us peace, give us direction. And Jesus' response in verse number 6 is a well-known verse. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So let's give you the last two Ps, the path and the person. The path and the person. There's no other way to have this comfort. There's no other way to have a prepared place. There's no other way to having a promise of spending eternity in heaven. There's no, there's no way that our troubles will be removed except through Jesus Christ. Now, I know that by and large, we're, we're talking this morning to people who know the Lord as their Savior. And, and for you, uh, you have access to the solution, but it could be somebody here today, and your trouble is you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I will tell you as bluntly and kindly as I can that the only way trouble has any hope of being dealt with is through Jesus Christ. I am the way. The truth, the life. It's not like I hope to be, I might be. No, no, no. I am. Hey, guys, if you want your trouble taken care of, it's the path, which is through Jesus Christ, the person. And he's pretty clear about this this morning. So, again, it would be remiss for me not to say, because there may be someone here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, if you walk out the door without Jesus as your personal Savior, you're going to carry all the troubles with you. Okay? So I would say today, why fight it any longer? You know the truth, yield to the truth, ask Christ to be your Savior, forgive, uh, repent of your sins, and allow Him to come into your life and begin to uh, uh, help you uh, through life. Now, believer, believer, there's no need to walk out the door carrying the trouble. It's none. There's none. Now, it, it, by the way, I didn't say when you walk out the door, the trouble disappears, Okay. I mean, there's physical challenges that you guys have in here. They're not going away when you walk out the door. You're going to carry those with you because that's just called life. But the trouble we're talking about is the unrest in my soul, the, the lack of calmness in my spirit because I'm all bent up over the what if. Let me tell you the what if. I've gone to prepare a place for you. That's the what if. That doesn't minimize the pain that we, we feel, but put it in perspective. So Jesus says to the disciples, there's no other way to have this comfort. If you know Him as your Savior, hold on to these truths. If you don't know Him as your Savior, I encourage you to get that settled today. Eric preached on Wednesday night. If you missed it, you missed a great message. And he talked about recipes. I didn't go home and try to make your cake, though. That, would, that didn't sound right to me. But he talked about recipes, a recipe of God's peace. And I was thinking about that this week. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, you don't need to turn here, but it said, And the peace of God, and the peace of God which passeth all of understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, it's the peace of God. And we understand, let not your heart be troubled, means that I, I have to have the peace of God. And as a believer here this morning, we have access to the peace of God. And there's a recipe for getting that, but we have access to the peace of God. But it could be this morning that, again, somebody here, you are looking for the peace of God, but what you really need is the peace with God. Because Romans says in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no peace of God, which is what a believer gets, until a person becomes a believer and has peace with God. So two groups that we're speaking to. One, you may not know Christ as Savior. Today, when in, a, in a few moments, we'll have a hymn. Uh, an imitation song, I'd encourage you just to get that taken care of. We're going to have somebody take a word, the word of God, and show you exactly how you can know Christ as your Savior. Two, Christian, you walked in the door with a trouble, don't walk out with it. Don't walk out with it. 
Jesus Christ is saying to you today, let not your heart be troubled. I was reminded of a hymn. And we'll close with this. Let not your heart be troubled, His tender word I hear. In resting on His goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path He leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. I sing, and I'm not going to. I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Jesus says to all of us this morning, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you... I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, here's the person, that where I am, there ye may be also. Don't leave with your troubles. Jesus is here to help you with that. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll have our folks come as we start to close out for the day. Our Father, we thank you for the clear uh, passage.